job there, I think. Thanks for submitting your questions. And I'll kind of work on the fly and work them into the conversation. You've hit a lot of the same topics that uh, I've thought about beforehand and I, I, that I've talked to some of the panelists about before. <coughs> uh, and, and just as another point of introduction, these are issues that I think a lot professionally because I follow agriculture for NET and Harvest, but they also uh, sort of have an impact on me personally. I come from a farm in southwest Iowa, so when I think about these things, a lot of times I'm thinking about my neighbors in Cass County and the land in Cumberland, and, and my parents and what they mean to them and for the work they do every day. So uh, the land and water are under pressure. Farmers are under pressure. Rural communities are under pressure. It just feels like there's a lot of tension in the food system right now. And uh, as we heard Paul talking, maybe a lot of that comes down to some of these big questions that are either hard to answer or hard to ask. And I'm glad that these producers have agreed to join us to sort of give us their thoughts on some of the things. And so first, I, I just wanted to kind of open it up to the folks on the panel. If any of you would uh, give me your, your first reaction to the kind of philosophical divide that, that Paul was talking about, this view of um, this agrarian view and this industrial view, and um, and how you see yourselves fitting in there. And, First, I'll have you, uh, we'll have everyone answer this one. If I could start sort of toward my side and have you all uh, just introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your farm and then uh, give me your thoughts on what you think about that <coughs> uh, philosophical divide and where you see yourself. In. Hello, everyone. I am Ellen Walsh Roseman and um, I'm a farmer from Harlan, Iowa. And I farm with my husband Daniel and his parents, and we have. Um, 700 acres, all certified organic, and we grow everything. <laughs> um, we do commodity crops, uh, corn, soybeans, um, we grow small grains to feed our cattle and our hogs, as well as feed the cattle and hogs, so the soybeans and the corn, and um, we have hay and pasture, and um, I've been on the farm for almost five years, and we started a vegetable enterprise and an egg enterprise when I moved to the farm just to kind of make room for me to go into the operation. Um, and, um, and then I also help other farmers deliver their foods and uh, with, uh, distribution, delivery, and uh, procurement in Iowa and in Nebraska. So I'm working all over the state of Iowa and some into Nebraska. I'm very conflicted now. I don't know where I fall and I, I can see with different issues that you know you can take little bits and pieces of each thing and um, so um, I guess I really don't know where I fall in the in the well, different we'll get categories. Some of the issues and find so. out where you're <laughs> <laughs> I'm Dave Wells. I'm from Melford, Nebraska, which is about 30 miles <laughs> southwest of Lincoln. Uh, we've been certified organic since '93, uh, probably about the same size here, or around five, six hundred acres of crop ground, a couple hundred acres of pasture. Uh, we direct market chickens and beef since like 1990, I believe. This is my wife Deb in the front row here. So uh, anywhere I go, she goes, and vice versa, pretty much. So definitely a partnership in our operation. Um, yeah, it's a tough. Uh, to put me on a panel after a philosopher speaks, I'm a numbers guy. I, I started out as a math major, ended up as an ag education major, but uh, I'm more of a numbers guy than a philosophy guy. But uh, um, yeah, the, the one part that I, I like from Dr. Thompson's talk was kind of the sustainability issues, some of the being robust, resilient, adaptive, as uh, Lincoln and Jefferson talked about. And the, the resiliency, I think, is what we we've lost in agriculture and, and the main factor that I see that we've lost to, to be more resilient is the organic matter in our soils. It's, it's drastically gone down from you know Louisiana purchase days to today certainly and, and especially probably in the last 100 years. And, uh, some of the new technology could, could help to enhance that, such as like no-till. I'm not a no-till person being organic. I haven't quite mastered that yet, although there is some pretty interesting research on no-till organic. But uh, 
just trying to not just maintain our soils, but trying to rebuild our soils, which it's a lot harder to rebuild soils than, than the easiness in which it was to tear them apart over the last 100, 200 years. But uh, that's one of my thoughts. Good afternoon. I'm Denise O'Brien, and um, I'm pleased to be here and talking to you folks this afternoon. My husband, Larry Harris, doesn't always go where I go because one of us is always staying home. We made a pact in the 1980s during the farm crisis that I would be the one that would go out on the road and do things and Larry would stay home and take care of the kids and the farm. So we still start, we don't have the same situation as we had then, but uh, uh, it was, he's a, works on bridge construction and today it was too cold to be out there in the crane. So he uh, got a day off and I, we have the pleasure of coming to Omaha together, which we don't do many things together it seems like. So. I appreciate what you had to say, Dr. Thompson, because um, that conflict and that tension is so there. And it's so there, I see in the, one thing I was just <coughs> mentioning to my husband was, um, because in that special category, in the ag sector category, there are people who think they're special within both categories. And we see that tension that, that when, and I think, it, I feel like personally it has to do with when agriculture became sectorized into soybeans and corn and beef and, and um, hogs, that we were never together again as a whole, as agriculture. We all had our different piece that we were taking care of. And, and I think that tension built through that, that, those times. And then as we've learned what types of, as we've progressed in the use of, of chemicals and um, practices of, of technology, uh, it's become a bigger divide. Now, my farm isn't quite like their farm. Um, their farms, my husband and I started out in 1976. I met him and he said uh, he wanted to be an organic farmer. And it's like, whoa, okay. <laughs> um, I lived in, on the East Coast and the West Coast and come back to Iowa to stay for a little while. And that was almost 40 years ago. So. Um, uh, we have gone from uh, cow-calf to dairy and then to a smaller, right now we have a, um, a CSA, a Community Supported Agriculture Farm with direct marketing and we have a high tunnel which is an unheated greenhouse that we produce in and we last year for the first time produced things for nine months out of the year and I'd like to try for 12 months um, and, and those now are going to be some good markets. So. Um, and I'm thrilled because there are more small farms coming in Western Iowa now. I'm from near Atlantic, in the same from the same county as, as Grant. We um, talked yesterday on the phone, and he, I live in the northern part, and he lives in the southern part. But um, we uh, we now are getting some farmers in our part of the state that we have enough small farmers now that we can have a potluck. And Larry and I have been waiting about 40 years for that, so I'm really thrilled. So, so I come from a different perspective, but come from a perspective of having um, been larger and going and going smaller. And, um, I, and again, I appreciate what you had, the thoughts that are being provoked in my head and trying to sort them out as we sit here on the panel. Thank you. Thanks, Denise. Uh, Jim, you're there on the end. Tell us a little bit about your farm and where you think you fit in on this uh, spectrum between agrarian and industrial. Uh, <clears throat> my name is Jim Bender. Uh, our farm is situated uh, just between Lincoln and Omaha, right, uh, right, in, the, <clears throat> right in the center of Cass County. Uh, our um, organic farming project uh, commenced in 1975. Uh, the most fervent and I hope the most conspicuous aspect of our farming uh, has been environmentalism. Uh, so as I try to associate that with Dr. Thomas, uh, Thompson's uh, uh, contrasting uh, conceptions of agriculture, uh, I, I, I'm not able to re I'm, I'm able to res resonate with hardly anything uh, on the uh, the industrial side, but regarding the uh, agrarian side, there are some twists in his conception, and uh, I, I need to think further and, and listen further. Uh, Decide uh, just exactly how a, 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 an environmentally uh, centered uh, agricultural system uh, 
fits in that second conception. Technology is like any other tool that farmers have access to. Um, I think maybe back, you know, 30, 40, 50 years ago, maybe we had more tools because we were more diversified in the crops that we had. Therefore, we needed more diverse tools. And, and like Ellen said, you know, today we're more specialized. We we're either grow corn or beans or we're specific to one type of livestock. But uh, uh, think, for example, like no-till, and which typically uses Roundup herbicide. That uh, some of us are maybe opposed to the whole genetically engineering aspect of agriculture today, but the, those tools themselves, uh, you know, no-till, could help build up our organic matter in our soils. That could be a good thing. Uh, but what I've seen in, in our area of the state is that uh, as no-till became more prevalent and farmers could use chemicals to keep fields perfectly clean, the equipment became bigger, so you went from maybe four or eight row equipment up to 16 to 32 row to even larger planters today. The spray booms are 100 feet wide. Uh, doesn't give much of a chance to like a grass to waterway or, or to fence lines. You know, they're disappearing. Trees are disappearing. So, sorry uh, to interrupt a little bit. Sure. But a lot of farmers would look at that equipment and say, that's progress. Look at how the equipment is growing. We're able to do more. Uh, and cover more ground with one run, that's a sign of progress. How, how do you view that kind of thing? Certainly would fit the efficient uh, title, if that's what you're looking for. But the, and those are good tools, I think, but they need to be used properly, just like any tool that we've had over the years. And if that tool was used in a way in which you could uh, sustain uh, your grass waterway, I mean, when grass waterways disappear, you have in my opinion, there's probably the net result is just as much or more erosion than what we had prior to no-till. So the, the tool that was created to, to help save our soil, I think it's at a net zero result at, at best. And, and so like any tool, any technology, it's all on how we apply it. Um, in, in my small marketing now that I'm not um, a large farmer, um, technology is incredible. And especially, um, I mean, when we started out organically farming in the 70s, to find anyone who was doing the same sort of thing as we were was, you know, was almost unheard of. And um, <coughs> now I have a problem in the field, and I can take a picture of it, and I can send it to, you know, Iowa State or, you know, Maryland or Vermont or wherever, and get an answer back, Just and, and it just blows me away that I can do this. I can also use technology as marketing, as a marketing tool, and, and use all of that. And I, I think David said, was is really um, right on saying, talking about pro appropriate use. I think one thing I see in my career of farming is that um, my neighbors and that have just about embraced every kind of technology and and everything saying that they're being progressive farmers and I always have held a little bit back saying appropriateness, <coughs> there's appropriate technology and um, to question whether or not we, really, we need it. Maybe our neighbor needs it but maybe we don't but um, there's a lot of peer pressure in farm country about having the same tools and building up for you know what, what everybody has. So I think a lot of times farmers may not question the appropriateness or the uh, application of it in the way we should. The typical farmer in no offense is lazy and um, doesn't want to think outside their comfort zone and they just do what everyone else does. Um, they don't want to be uncomfortable. They don't want to be the person that walks in the coffee shop and everyone's like, why are you doing that? Um, like on our farm, we just, I, I, I don't like using technology in the, um, in the sense that it's something that's new. Like on our farm, we like to use a lot of practical research and just like biology and those kinds of technology, like working with the soil. Um, and uh, we're, we're in with practical farmers, Ohio, so we've done lots of research on our farms, and 
on our farm about you know how to reduce our tillage, how to get more yields, how to reduce our inputs, and um, I think a lot, a lot of our neighbors come to those field days and hear our presentations and they're like, oh, that's really great, but then they don't ever implement it because it's too scary. They're, they don't want to take that extra effort to really um, change or adapt their farm to do something that's really practical that could actually be saving them money and lowering their input costs and such. I'm, I'm just struck by uh, how uh, comically ill-suited I am to handle this uh, technology subject. Uh, I've never had a cell phone, and, <laughs> and I and, and, and Brian heat with wood. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I think, uh, oh, and when uh, Dr. Thompson mentioned uh, nanotechnology, Mr. Mark, I was wishing I had a dictionary. <laughs> um, I think hard and a lot about how to um, come up with the most positive environmental impact uh, uh, of the way I farm. And it seldom occurs to me to thought technology as I pursue that subject. But alas, uh, I, I resolved this spring to uh, try to use the internet to help me to have a deeper understanding of a particular, particularly difficult uh, weed uh, problem that I have. So uh, perhaps I like uh, Rip Van Winkle and waking me from a great slumber. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the internet. <laughs>
I mean, we've, we've got some property that has drain tile in it because there's excessive moisture on the surface and it'd be difficult to farm if we didn't tile it. Uh, yet at the same time, the practices that we use on the surface, and I, I don't believe are causing any nitrate problems because we don't apply nitrogen fertilizer to our ground. So it, is, is it the practice of tiling that's the problem or is it the practices that are taking place above ground that are the problem? I think before you create a law to, to ban something, you need to find out what the real issue is. Right. Uh, there could be uh, multiple other kinds of issues too, whether it has to do with um, the chemicals farmers use or the uh, tillage that farmers use or different things. And this is one case where it's come to sort of this sort of crisis moment. And you can imagine other situations in the past where the change is obvious, like in the dust bowl or something. <coughs> Farmers have this immediate incentive to do something differently. In this case, it's really unclear how you how you sort of get them to cause them some change. I just want to make a comment that I hate that um, our policies are so reactive and we're not proactive. And that I have no idea for a solution from I mean, other than non-voluntary compliance for a constitution. Paul, do you have any thoughts on this? I don't. I wish I don't have an answer, but I do think that you're right to point to the idea that uh, you know there there's a real challenge here where uh, you need cooperative action, collective action. Um, you know that's probably an issue that uh, uh, you know Jefferson's farmers didn't face so much. Um, but uh, um, you know it, it does strike me that uh, uh, that this philosophical contrast that I was trying to out, outline speaks to this issue in the sense that um, you know when, when you you know when your policy tools are essentially the same policy tools that you have you know for dealing with uh, you know people who are operating gas stations and um, you know factories and so on then um, you're kind of you know forced into a box that uh, it is uh, I, I think kind of where a lot of these issues are today. Um, the the alternative, right? You know the agrarian view. It doesn't have an easy answer uh, because it 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 really is going to require some cooperative action on the part of farmers and you know they're. They may have uh, very good reasons for independently for um, you know preferring one approach to another approach, and uh, um, but you know if they it, if there is a sense that uh, you know agriculture has special environmental responsibilities and should because it has special re environmental responsibilities also have. Uh, special kinds of supports. I don't know what those supports need to be, but if that sense is widely held, uh, then I think those issues take a different shape uh, than they currently, um, than, than the shape that they're currently taking. Um, you know, it it's, it's, does, doesn't make it easy to resolve these kinds of problems, but uh, uh, I think to the extent that both farmers themselves see themselves as uh, having certain kinds of entitlements to operate um, on the one hand the way any firm would and then also kind of expect to get some special treatment. Um, you know, that, that kind of doesn't help from the farm side. Uh, but, uh, you know, you, you've got a major problem, I think, just because, uh, you know, people who um, are going to be voting and, and uh, you know, participating in, this polit in these political debates from the perspective of someone who has no connection to the food system, you know, why should they regard this problem as any different than if there's, a, you know, a, a, a small factory or, you know, somebody who's operating a dry cleaning is the business and, you know, putting chemicals into the environment, right? Um, the idea that, uh, that, that uh, farming needs to be treated uh, differently really needs to have broader resonance to, I think, make more creative solutions available.
Um, that's not to tie an earlier subject with this one. Let's not let the irony be lost on us that uh, tile outlets were intended to be a technological fix to uh, a reported problem. And to provide a little context, uh, you know, the issue is here, here is how do we um, most effectively drain excess, excessive uh, uh, rainfall off of agricultural lands. And for decades, uh, farmers have employed systems systems of grass waterways. Uh, the, the idea of tile water, the, the tile waterways was a way to avoid uh, the uh, maintenance issues associated with grass waterways. And, and, and to, to put a, a sort of a system of plumbing in the field not, not entirely unlike an urban uh, sewer system. And now the idea, now the worry is that um, it leads to excessive uh, pollution of uh, uh, downstream uh, waterways, uh, 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 water in the other streams. As a food producer, <coughs> I think my our my role in climate change is to bring back food production, actual um, people. <coughs> uh, Cons consumption of my food when, be when the other parts of the country collapse without any water. I mean, we all depend on 90% of the food that comes into Iowa is imported, or 90% of our food that comes into the state is, you know, is consumed in our state. So we have a lot of ways to go, which some people think is going back, because we used to produce, before the 1940s, we produced most of our food in the state. And, and so we, because of the change in agriculture. Um, so I'm part of a, a you know, a, a group of people that's bringing back food production to be in a localized area so that we don't depend on fossil food so much and that we have healthy, good, nutritious food that's raised closely at home that has more nutrient value to it. So, in, in now that I'm, I've, I've decreased, and my husband and I have decreased our farm size, is what we feel like our piece can be. Although then we continue to work on, we, because we know that vegetable farmers also uh, contribute to carbon in the, in the air because we till a lot. And so it's one of those things, how can we keep um, our ground cover on, how can we keep cover crops on, and not be killing so much for those weeds that we're trying to get rid of. And so it's always about finding different techniques and maybe technologies in that in order to keep the carbon in the soil. When we think of climate change, we, we think of releasing carbon, you know, mainly from fuel emissions. But I'd, I'd like to find a study that would say how much carbon has been released from our soils. You know, like those. Yeah, I'm sure I can find it. I just haven't taken the time to do it. But it, I'm assuming it's a fairly large, large percentage of, of the total carbon emissions. And, and I wouldn't say an easy fix, but it's certainly a re reversible. I mean, we can put organic matter back into our soils. I mean, in the 20-some years that we've been farming organically, our, our soils have gone from 1.8 to 2.2% organic matter to being in the 3 to 4% range now. So I know we can put organic matter back into the soil, and even, even if we do, and typically as an organic farmer, we do till our soils more. But there's other practices that we use that offset that, and resulting in a net positive of organic matter increase. So it's, again, depends. One tool might be negative, but you can add three other tools that are positive and, and come up with the result that you're looking for. I'm going to tie in um, a, a good use of technology um, to our farm. We use social media. Denise mentioned that as well. Um, I'm right now. We're you know we're doing our farm planning and we're polling our customers about even things like what color eggs do you prefer. Um, so we always are listening because uh, especially when you're dealing with local food, um, your market is a lot smaller. So they're the ones who are buying it. So you need to really listen to what they want and what the demands are. And then just in the last uh, you know, 
almost five years that we are growing vegetables. Um, it's really interesting to see the trends, you know, like hot vegetables, what's trendy. And, um, now that I deal a lot with chefs and uh, retail markets, I hear a lot about what they want, too. And, uh, you know, of course, in our growing season, there's a lag. We're not like California where can grow year-round. So, can people demand things um, one year, it's going to happen probably the next year. Um, so, that just that happens. But, uh, with our um, cattle and hogs, we, we definitely see ups and flows, too, with um, what people want when it comes to meat. Um, for a couple of years, we did we did have just a strictly grass-fed um, beef line, but it, it became too too long of uh, time to finish our cattle. Um, anyone smiling at me? Um, that we decided not to do strictly grass anymore, um, and our consumers were fine with that. Um, we still do have people asking for grass-fed beef. It's like, well, they do get fed grass, but they also get fed corn. So, um, yes, for our farm, we do listen to consumers um, a lot, especially when we're farm planning. Well, and because there's all this issue now of consumers and customers putting pressure on the farmers, it used to be, as an organic farmer uh, way back, um, and during the farm crisis of the 80s, we were always, the farmers that, um, I worked with and hung out with them that always knew that it would be a consumer, that we had to depend on the consumers to change the system like we wanted to see it change because there were so few of us in that, in, in that um, we were very much in a minority and still are in a lot of ways. So we were really dependent on the, the consumers. Now the, the larger farmers who are using the, the more technology, uh, the, the confined animal feeding operations, the uh, biotechnology and that are really upset because they've adapted and adopted pro pro um, machinery, um, all of the things, all the tools that they've been told to because they're growing food for the world, that they really are not liking it, that consumers and urban people are influencing the way they farm. And I saw that, I was at the Iowa State Capitol on Tuesday working on some issues and the water issue is you know really hot in Iowa and there were farmer legislators there that were really really upset about you know the suit that's going on in the three uh, you know counties and that on the one hand they won't don't want to be told what to do but there is a problem so and it's a point of contention that we need strong leadership to bring people together to work out the problem and make a, a solution to it but we have our governor saying well you know, urban, uh, urban Iowa is, is declaring war on rural Iowa. Well, if you're a leader of a state, that's not the kind of thing that's going to resolve any problems. So it's, and it is, it's, it's just like it is um, this, this tension that manifests itself in those ways. So, yeah. Well, let me kind of phrase the, this in terms of the, you know, interacting with consumers. I mean, I think one of the things that's, uh, encouraging about some of the new consumer interests is frankly just that they're taking much more interest in the food system. I mean, I think that's positive. Um, and, and one of the things that I think is uh, uh, important when it's possible, and I realize it's not always possible, but is that when you're um, responding to consumer concerns, when you're, or, or consumer interests, trying to give them things they want, um, if you can use that as an opportunity to pull people a little deeper into understanding what's going on in food, agriculture, and environment. That's that's what I think will really <coughs> encourage, you know, I, I mean, I'm, I, I'm not, I, I, I'm not comfortable in terms of myself in terms of where I sit between these two philosophies I outlined, and I'd like to see them in a, in a deeper conversation with one another than I typically see. Uh, but one of the things that uh, I do think is important about a more agrarian way of thinking is that I think um, the engagement that the average person has with their food can be a way in which they can be brought to see um, and understand these more comprehensive system level questions about the sustainability of our environment. 
um, you know, it's a way that you can actually get somebody to actually think about something like soil matter. Um, uh, but uh, so so um, one of the the ways where I work a little practically is with a, a CSA in Michigan, and you know we've really kind of resisted just sort of taking orders you know, from our members, right? Um, and we really try to we do you know try to give people what they want. And, you know, usually the message we got is not so much kale. You know. <laughs> but, uh, uh, at least that's the message I always try to give. But, but uh, um, the uh, uh, you know the, the 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 thing that we really try to encourage <coughs> is to get people a little deeper than just a preference for what they want to eat, um, and to actually think about you know what the larger consequences and the difficulties that are faced with meeting some of these kinds of preferences. And so it's, it's just a way to kind of, you know, it is a way that I think agriculture could, you know, in, much, in a way that's not the same as in Jefferson's time, but it's a way in which agriculture could become a kind of foundation for a more sustainable society. Um, you know, I don't think we're ever going to get back to, you know, 60% of the population farming. Uh, and I'm not sure that's a good idea. But uh, um, if we got to a situation where a larger percentage of people had some, had the kind of appreciation that, of the effect of farming on the, the broader environment that all the people up here seem to have, that would be a real positive uh, change that I think would be a way in which we'd be kind of revitalizing a kind of agrarian understanding of what agriculture can do for us. When he came to the point that he talked about the upshot for sustainability, uh, I immediately thought of sustainability as I have for the past 40 years or so in terms of uh, what needs to be done <clears throat> for good agriculture to perpetuate itself. But as he quoted Lincoln and Jefferson, they were interested in well, what agriculture could do for the country. What can agriculture do to support the overall sustainability of our most desirable political institutions. And uh, I thought that was, uh, you know, almost turned it, uh, well, perhaps it did turn it on its head uh, in, in, in thinking about sustainability in, in relation to uh, our subject. Well, we, we did talk about that yesterday, and, and one of the reasons we did is because I think about it perhaps inordinately, because I sit, as I said, right between Lincoln and Omaha, and so it's sort of a dreadful future that things there. Uh, in fact, just this morning on NPR, we were uh, talking about, on the morning edition, there was a discussion of implications of, of population increase for uh, um, transportation in urban areas, and they began the the thing by, by the projecting that in 2045 it would be as difficult to commute in Omaha. Well, they said Omaha would be the new Los Angeles. Well, where does that leave my humble organic farm 25 minutes away? I, I guess, I think probably everybody, anybody who cared enough about agriculture to come to this today has awareness of and thoughts about it. Sprawl. I, I guess I just want to say that as I try to understand it and project what's going to happen, uh, it's hard to identify any uh, uh, sources of pushback against sprawl. I mean, everybody seems to have a vested interest in it or to be uh, sort of indifferent to it. Uh, I noticed in this last, last election, a lot of the local politicians' best ideas for being elected uh, was moving uh, economic development as fast as possible down Highway 50. Uh, it, I, I just don't, uh, I don't see any constituency for, for pushback. Uh, and if, if, if that's true, it, it's, uh, uh, it's about as serious as a problem. Well, I, I'd just like to address what Jim was just talking about because I just um, am a member on a new, uh, of the board on a new organization that actually is, it's a land trust. It's, it's called the Sustainable Iowa Land Trust. And, and it's about protecting land to grow healthy food. So it's about taking land and not out of production, but 
making it specifically for the growing of food. And what it does is take the land out of the commodity market, out of development, and out of the, the you know farmers buying each other out and helping beginning farmers start on the land without having to buy to capitalize and, and buy you know land. And and so I think there is I mean that sounds like a horrible scenario or uh, and I'm sure I won't be around to witness that, but um, that I think that the the around Omaha, Lincoln, Des Moines, all of these places that, that people it's <laughs> land is a commodity and it's used as development and there has to be means to, to take that out of that equation. Thank you.